All right, everyone, this is a 30 second uh, advisory here. We are about to go live with our latest session of our 2021 virtual outdoor expo conversation with a waterways conservation officer and we'll be live in just a few seconds. All right. Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. And thank you again for joining us for another session as part of our 2021 virtual outdoor expo presented by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. We are presenting these virtual sessions on Facebook this week. Remember, if you can't watch now, if you're not watching and you'd like to check out our sessions later, we'll be archiving all of this content uh, here on the Facebook page, the PFBC YouTube page, as well as our website, fishandboat.com. So, Check in for that content coming in a few days from now. As a reminder, a schedule of all of our remaining events for this week is available on the Facebook page. So just continue to scroll down the feed to learn more about what we have to come here through Friday. My name is Mike Parker, the communications director for the agency. And this morning, we're excited to bring you a session called a conversation with a conservation officer. And actually, we'll be speaking with two members of our Fish and Boat Commission law enforcement staff. I am pleased to welcome Colonel Corey Britcher, Director of the Bureau of Law Enforcement, as well as Waterways Conservation Officer Rachel Turner Diaz. Welcome to you both. Morning, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Corey is coming to us from our Harrisburg headquarters. Uh, Rachel, you are in Western Cumberland County, it, it, down there in uh, the Newville area. I am. I'm at the South Central Regional Office this morning. Excellent, excellent. So uh, thank you both of, for, for joining us this morning. A reminder to those who are checking out the session live on Facebook that your questions for our officers are welcome throughout this uh, you know, 40 minutes or so that we'll be spending with them. Um, we do just want to remind you that all uh, questions and comments, we may not be able to get to everything during this time period, but we will try to get to the relevant questions that our officers will be able to answer. We'll do our best to get you an answer on the other end of things if we don't have it for you right now. So let's begin here. I just want to talk to you both a little bit about yourselves, you know, before we get into some of the frequently asked questions. The point of this whole uh, get together is that normally uh, this time of year, you'd both be out and about at least uh, a couple of times at, at these outdoor shows and expos, as we know, they're not happening. So this is a chance to have some of that one on one time with the public. So first things, Corey, Colonel Britcher, I will start with you. Let's, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, what led you to a career in conservation law enforcement? All right, thanks, Mike. But as you mentioned, Corey Britcher, I'm currently the director of law enforcement. Um, I grew up in Perry County in the Newport area, and of course, fishing and hunting and outdoor activities was was paramount and important part of of growing up. And uh, I went away to college and and came out with a uh, bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And my my whole intention was to try to become a state police trooper. Um, I was also looking at some federal opportunities, and uh, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to the Game Commission, believe it of all things, uh, their deputy program. And I became a deputy wildlife conservation officer at the time. Now it's a deputy state game warden. And uh, once I started doing that, I uh, reevaluated my whole career choice and uh, career path and uh, started testing for not only the Game Commission, but also the Fish and Boat Commission. And um, the Fish and Boat Commission contacted me. I interviewed, uh, you know, got a chance at the position of waterways conservation officer. No regrets, no looking back. It's been 25 years, 27 total years with the Commonwealth, um, but 25 years with the Fish and Boat Commission. It, it's been fantastic. All right. And uh, Rachel, the same question for you. A little bit about your background and what, what led you to a career with the Fish and Boat Commission. Sure. Currently, I'm the Adams Western York County officer. Um, I grew up right here in Adams County. Um, <clears throat> I grew up learning to the fish and hunt from my father and, and as well. Um, so I went on to a career or, or thinking I was going to have a career. Outdoors. Um, I took a different path at first. Uh, I took I wanted to go into biology, working out in the field. Um, I did internships with DEP, did a lot of outside field work. Um, so I knew I didn't want to be in an office setting. 
and just so happened that my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, got a job with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission in the hatchery setting. So when I, so I kind of was familiar with the agency. Um, and when I graduated from college, it just so happened that this job position had came over on the civil service uh, commission. So um, I wasn't really looking for an opportunity in law enforcement, but being an avid fisherman and boater, um, I definitely took at heart. Uh, those type of conservation activities. And um, I applied for the job and, and now I, I'm absolutely happy that I did because this is something that definitely is perfect for my life. Um, and I also get to work with my husband hand in hand um, in the in the trout setting. So that's where my background came from. Um, like I said, I'm in my home, my home district. So um, I'm very happy and I'm very uh <clears throat> Um, familiar with this area so always helps to know the region because that's one of the things I guess about a, a waterways conservation officer is when you will get into a little bit about the academy and uh, the selection of a region but really you have to be pretty open to going anywhere right sure yep um, you when you go through the it's quite lengthy, but they sure do tell you that um, you may go anywhere without the state and you are required to reside in that area. So that was something that I, I knew from the beginning that I would be able, um, I would have to go somewhere. So I just got lucky enough to, to get my home area. Excellent. All right. Well, again, if we were at one of these outdoor shows, let's say the Great American that, you know, would be happening this week in Harrisburg. I know that you spent time there because it's, it's uh, a short drive from from your home region. Um, maybe it's a fly fishing show uh, across the state or the Philadelphia boat show. Whenever someone sees a, a fish and boat commission officer, they always want to come up and bend your ear. I've seen it in person. <laughs> they, they want to know. So Rachel, I'll just stick with you for a quick, just, they want to know, what do you do every day? That's sort of your base question. So why don't you go ahead as a, as an active officer out in the field on a daily basis, just give us a couple a little bit of a rundown of your daily responsibilities. Sure. So it's kind of dependent on the year or the time of year, which is great for us because you never you never get too comfortable doing one thing before you going on to the next thing. So right now, here we are. Um, our stocking season actually is going to be starting early. So we would be at the shows and um, doing all that public relation events. But right now, we're trying to gear up for our stocking season. So Right now, I'm I'm trying to run my trout streams, making sure that you know bridges are out, landowner issues have been resolved, to prepare ourselves for the upcoming trout season. So throughout the spring, we're avidly stocking trout, um, and then as well, we have the opening trout opener, where then we're constantly um, doing law enforcement in in our trout streams. Uh, come the early summer. Um, we start to gear towards boating season. Um, in this side of the region, we have a lot of state parks and, and the Susquehanna River. Um, so throughout the summer, we're trying to focus on those areas, doing a lot of boat uh, boat law enforcement. As the summer ends, we, we kind of gear towards uh, the fall, which we might get some duck hunters and things like that. And people are, kids are going back to school. So hunting kind of gears back up. And we, we try to work with our sister agency as much as we can. Um, trying to help the, the state game wardens in our area um, with archery season and then through the rifle season. Um, and that, by that time, it takes you to the end of the year where you're kind of tidying up your district with all your paperwork um, and then just gearing back up for some public relations stuff there in, in the, the early parts of the year and start all over again. Corey, your role has uh, evolved over the years as you've you know gone up the, the chain of command now to the director of the bureau. Do you want to give us an idea of uh, what things are like there, uh, you know, how many officers you oversee, what the staff looks like, and what some of your daily responsibilities are? Yeah, sure, Mike. Yeah, I, I was the uh, district officer in southern Huntington County for a long time until I took a promotion to sergeant and then captain and, and now to the Harrisburg headquarters as the colonel. Um, at full complement, there's a there's hundred of us across the state, a hundred full-time WCOs. And that's from, you know, the, the, the lowliest WCO just out of the training school up through the, the colonel position. There's a hundred of us. Um, we have another about, right now, about 52 um, deputy uh, officers, which are, are considered volunteer officers that, that help augment what we do out there. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, 
you know, it, it's it's year round. You know, when I first come on 25 years ago, uh, everybody would say, if you really like to hunt, you should work for the Fish and Boat Commission. If you like to fish, you should work for the Game Commission. Well, that sort of went out the window because it, it's it's become a year round um, busy season. It used to be that there'd be the lull, you know, after the boating season through the fall into the winter until, until stocking season started again. Um, but with the activity in the field, uh, there's just always something going on. You know, if there's no ice, there's people out kayaking or boating. Uh, if there is ice, they're fishing through the holes. Um, so it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, the Fish and Boat Commission, they used to think that there was a slow time. There's really not anymore. We're busy year round. Um, so, you know, for me, I'm pretty much tied to this thing right here most days. I, I do get to go out in the field once in a while. Um, but uh, right now, the big thing is administrative oversight. You know, we do have a class going right now. Um, like I said, at full complement, we have 100 officers running around the state doing their thing. And uh, it, it just it just keeps it hopping. It, it's, you know, um, we're like any other um, law enforcement department, police department, and that we have things that we have to do training. Uh, quartermaster's busy uh, getting supplies and everything and just policy updates and you name it. Uh, it it's, it's just a it's a different type of work um, for me, uh, but it's one of those that that has progressed through my career and uh um, it's just one of those things. It's a needed, needed thing. We need to get the paperwork done. It, it's one of those things we tell every new cadet into the training facility is that, you know, no job is complete uh, to the paperwork's done. And if, if it's not done correctly, you know, it just means more time in the office. So um, that's from the top all the way down. I want to take a second here to uh, recognize the, our producer for our session here today which is Andy Desco. He's one of our Southeast Region Education Specialists. Andy is uh, helping us keep the streaming going this morning. And I'm gonna ask Andy at this time to uh, uh, queue up the video uh, that we wanna show here. It's a recent Waterways Conservation Officer recruitment video. So as we get that one going, uh, I'll, I'll preface it this way. You've, you've both had successful careers to this point but of course, it all started with time at the Stackhouse School of Fishery Conservation and Watercraft Safety, otherwise known as the WCO Academy, located up in uh, Belfont, Center County. So I want to ask you both about your experiences there. Uh, first, though, as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at the short video featuring our most recent class of waterways conservation officers. So we'll give that second that video a second to load, and we'll take a look at this. And uh, you'll just watch here for a minute or two, and then we'll We'll come back. What does it take? To protect. 86,000 miles of rivers, streams, and lakes. What does it take? To conserve. Precious populations of fish, reptiles, and amphibians. What does it take? To enhance. World-class waters and our treasures. The places where we can unplug and reconnect with nature. And where nature often forces us to act. What does it take? Passion, commitment to every person and to everything that calls these places home. Do you have what it takes? To protect. To conserve. To enhance. To become. A waterways conservation officer. With the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. To protect. To conserve. To enhance. Pennsylvania's aquatic resources. Your office. Awaits. So, of course, the class that began in January of uh, of 2020 is, is now graduated, and uh, you added about 20 officers uh, to the ranks there. Uh, start with you, Colonel Britcher. Um, talk a little bit about how the most recent graduates have uh, adapted to their new roles as officers and then i also understand you know that we we have a new class of trainees currently at the academy if you want to give us an update on those folks sure mike yeah the last class graduated back in june at the time we had about 25 vacancies across the state so i know everybody like rachel who was who was covering more than just their their district um, was very thankful to get that new support into the field. They're all doing very well. Um, I, I'm happy to to report that our training program 
is a pretty good one. You know, we're one of the few states um, that has a year round or a year long training program that starts with, uh, um, you know, the actual uh, municipal police academy that we have the state police run for us. And then uh, we have an additional time in our stack house facility. Um, so it equals a full 52 weeks and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's lengthy. It's um, takes a lot of dedication to get through it. Um, but the end result is we, we put out a really good quality officer. So, you know, that last batch is doing really well in the field. They've all adjusted to their new districts and are, are still learning the job, but doing a, a great job um, out there. The new class we have, we tried something new. This last class is um, um, traditionally, like I said, the first part of our, our training training program is running everybody through the Municipal Police Officer Academy so that everybody's on the same playing field with every other law enforcement officer in the Commonwealth. And uh, this last class or this current class, we decided to try um, by hiring. We, we've always been told that there's a number of people out there in law enforcement that would love to do our job. Um, but they don't want to go through that Act 120 is what it's called. They don't want to do that again. And I, and I get that having been through, you know, basic training with the military, police academy, game academy. So I, I understand that and I get that. So we tried this this last go around to hire um, prior service law enforcement officers um, so that we could, could shorten the academy and get more people in the field quicker. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the numbers we would have liked to have seen, um, but we do have seven good quality cadets that are up at Stackhouse right now on doing that portion of the training. And uh, they'll be hitting the field here in the next month or so to do their field training part of the school, which means they go to districts and work with seasoned officers um, and really get some hands on, on on what the job of the waterways conservation officer is. And they are, are scheduled to graduate late June and, and hit the field. Um, but with that being said, Mike, you know, we're already in the process of putting together an another class um, that hopefully uh, we'll announce any day and uh, with all the re requirements and criteria for that, because um, even with this new class, we're anticipating some vacancies through retirements and other attrition. And uh, we want to we want to um, maintain that 100 percent in the field um, because it, it takes a lot to get the work done in a district. When you start working various districts, it's just a it's it's a big load. Um, so thankfully, the executive director, Tim Schaefer, it has uh, um, approved and been been really pushing, uh, which I'm thankful for, to get us at full staffing. So we're looking at doing another class uh, directly. Um, stay tuned for that. Check out our website. Check out the Civil Service website when that announcement hits. If you're interested in a career with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission as a waterways conservation officer, there's more opportunities coming. Mike, I think you're on mute. Look at that rookie mistake. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to make sure that I wasn't speaking over you there. So <laughs> as a reminder, just to play off what you said regarding employment, uh, as a reminder that we'll have uh, as part of our virtual outdoor expo later this week, Thursday morning at 10, um, we'll have a special session about employment with the Fish and Boat Commission with our uh, Director of uh, Human Resources, Maxine Johnson. And she does mention specifically because, you know, as you mentioned, Oh, the path to becoming a, a WCO is a little different than the path to another career because it involves some different requirements and things along the way. So more to come on that. Make sure to join us Thursday at this time. Uh, Rachel, uh, any any great memories from from the Academy? Any good stories that you can share? Um, you know, looking back on your time, when did you attend? And, uh, you know, was, was it the best time you never want to have again, or was it a, a good time that you, that you look back fondly on? Um, well, it wasn't too long ago for me. Um, 2015, um, out of my class, um, I ended up being the only, the only woman, um, throughout the second half of our training. So I was with, um, a whole bunch of other guys, but most of them were my age. Um, and we just, as a class, you, you're spending a whole year with these people. So you're five days a week, you know, throughout throughout the entire year. Uh, you become pretty good friends with a lot of people. And I would say that uh, I wouldn't say any specific memory, but more of um, it's one thing to to have a go into a job and you you're a new hire and it's just it's just you. But you're coming out in this kind of class type of 
camaraderie where you might be going all over the state. Um, I don't have any officers that I graduated next to me, um, but it's something that those friendships have been developed and it's somebody that you can confide in um, over the phone and, and through experiences throughout the years. And it's something that I've, I've developed long-term relationships as friends um, with other officers. And a lot of us are in the same um, part of our life where we're having young children and, and getting married and, and still trying to do a... Um, still trying to juggle our careers and it's it's just refreshing to be able to to reach out to other people even though you're kind of a solo off, a lone officer within your area so i would just say more of the relationships is something that i um, can remember the most from the academy well i'll stick with you we do have some questions coming in through our facebook broadcast this morning uh josette has a question that you might want to address here um if a young person wants to work with the Fish and Boat Commission, what kinds of education should they be pursuing? And they're asking, does that mean I should head to college or is there, is there another path? Um, and uh, the other question has, has to do specifically um, with young women who wanna pursue. Uh, it, it's just basically the same question, but also just asking about um, more on your experience uh, about, about being a, a female officer. So currently for our position, it's not required for you to do secondary education. You can get it with just having a high school diploma. But, um, I definitely encourage some uh, people who are interested in that uh, to become this job is to one, either maybe take a path in the military or two, to go on to secondary education. Um, I myself have a background in biology. Um, as uh, Colonel Britcher said, he has a... Um, a path in criminal justice. So those are two different ways that you could go that would definitely be beneficial um, to, to knowing the knowledge of this job. Um, for myself, the biology background really helps me whenever we're doing environmental stuff, as well as know it, you know, or being an avid hunter and fisherman, um, just knowing your species and things like that in the biology setting. But having a criminal justice background helps you with the law enforcement aspect and how to handle yourself in different situations. But if you don't have either of those backgrounds, say you go to the military, you're coming straight out of uh, high school. Um, because we have a year long training, you get six months just solely of uh, that Act 120 uh, municipal law enforcement uh, training. And then you go to Stackhouse where you get specific fishing and boating um, knowledge where you learn everything you need to know to do this job. I think you're muted again. <laughs> there we go. It's just, it's a new habit and it's a bad habit I've been getting into. So I don't, I, I clear my throat. I don't want it to uh, be, overtake your answer. Corey, here's a question for you from Facebook. Um, this person has a question about kayak fishing. Um, I will say that we may not be able to answer questions that have to do with fisheries management, but I want you to answer this from a law enforcement standpoint. This person is concerned about the stress of, of having um, fishing tournaments, too many fishing tournaments uh, on a particular body of water, thinking that it has an impact on the bass population. From your perspective, if you can answer that um, from a law enforcement uh, view, what, what are our officers doing to enforce regulations, um, give some oversight to fishing tournaments, in essence, to protect the, the population, including bass? All right. Um, the first thing we do, any fishing tournament that has at least 10 uh, people in it, um, you know, 10 or more, they're required to have a permit from the Fish and Boat Commission to hold that event. So that's the first first place we start. And when we're doing the permit review for that, we're looking at things like, you know, how many on a particular weekend or how many during a particular season. Um, catch reports are part of that, which then that information goes to um, the biologists so that they can look at that data for the fisheries management side of it, where maybe we do need to, to curtail some tournaments or bring in some other regulations uh, for, for sizes and, and, and everything. Um, one thing I will say, you know, in my 25 years experience with this agency is I've seen um, a lot of bass tournaments from early on 
when I was at Racetown Lake, you know, there was a lot of harvest, you know, people catch these big bass, they want to harvest them, um, either to get them mounted, to, to eat them, to, to do whatever with them, which, which, is, which is allowed by law and, and, and is okay. Um, but more and more today, and Rachel can probably speak to this as well, we're seeing more catch and release type of tournaments. Um, you know, they may take the fish to the weigh in, weigh it in, but then it goes back in the lake. And, and you know, there are some stressors put on those fish doing that, um, but the majority of them do survive and, and and live to be caught another day. So the whole tournament, I, I know some people look at tournaments negatively, um, but more and more, you know, they are they're really trying to do the right thing. Um, there's catch, measure, and release tournaments. I know the kayak uh, tournament circuit does a lot of that, where you catch it. Um, they have an app on their phone where they can they can log that catch with the size um, and snap that picture. It goes into their their app, into their website, and they release that fish. They don't even take it back to be weighed or measured back at the at the the launch ramp. Um, so so that's what we look at. Um, of course, then we also look at you know these tournaments as they're out there we, we we look at you know if they're using boats we're looking for safety stuff there we, we are looking for um you know people that are that are you know with their if it's a catch and weigh tournament you know are they are are they um do they have sublegal fish do they have uh are they are they culling so to speak without permission and culling means that you know, they're taking a fish and it, well, it's bigger than the last one they caught, so they switch it out. So we do look for those types of violations, um, you know, routinely for tournaments. But but by and far, uh, a lot of the tournament circuits that we have in Pennsylvania are, are really good. They're out there. Uh, they don't want to hurt the the, uh, the the fish. They don't want to hurt the numbers of fish. Um, they want that resource to continue so that they can keep coming back and enjoying it. You know, it just so happens that um, they're fishermen, they're anglers, uh, and they want to partake in a, an organized event. And, uh, um, it's, it's a lot of fun for them, you know, so, so that's in a nutshell, Mike, that's what we look at for, for those, uh, fishing tournaments. But again, anything 10 or more people has a permit and that just gets all kinds of, of oversight then, um, as far as checking into the background. Andy, I'm going to ask you to, uh, queue up another video here. And this one is going to be, uh, there's, no, there's no sound with this. So uh, Rachel, we'll, we'll start with you. We're just gonna go ahead and take a look at this video. And I want you to, it's, it's some video of WCOs in various situations. Meaning, I just want you to talk about the different, the different roles, uh, things that you might be doing and both feel free to chime in. And, and I'll start this one off by saying that, you know, um, this particular video here, I, I remember this one was taken uh, at, in the Three Rivers area near Point State Park in Pittsburgh. So these officers here, uh, Rachel, you want to talk about how often you patrol in a boat and, and the type of things that you're looking for on, say, a busy holiday weekend? Mm. Sure. I mean, we're throughout the summer, we're pretty much always on a boat, especially during the weekends. We pretty much work every single weekend and we work every single major holiday in the summertime because that's when our people are out. So that's when we are out. Um, these officers right here, um, well, during the boating season um, on a busy holiday, we're looking for, um, we have a, usually like in the beginning of the year, you've got everyone who's just got their boat out from, from, the, uh, from winterization. So we're looking to make sure that everyone didn't oversee whether or not they had their safety equipment. You know, a lot of people um, get their boats out of winterization, forget to put their life jackets back in. Um, their fire extinguishers may have gone bad over the winter and things like that. So what we try to do really is to try to be proactive and try to make as many contacts as we can prior to people going out. Um, a lot of like the, the Coast Guard do a lot of safety checks so that People aren't going out there without that required equipment um, before hitting the water, especially on a busy holiday weekend, whenever, um, you know, we might have not have checked our gas and we have bad gas and then people are stranded um, and things like that. So, and as the holiday, as the summer progresses and we're trying to do the holiday, like the 4th of July, we're just making sure that everyone's trying to be safe out there. You know, a lot of uh, people partake in alcoholic beverages and things like that. So we just want to make sure that everyone is safe um, and and not only the people who are driving, but other people around them are safe too. 
Andy, if you'd back that up there a second, just to the beginning of this particular section. And uh, Corey, let's talk about the importance of training and, and talk a little bit about what's what's going on in this in this video that we're looking at right here. Um, obviously, this is the time of year where something like this might come in handy. Uh, sure, yeah. Well, there you got Officer Rich Mortar in Perry County stocking uh, <laughs> probably uh, home and lake at Little Buffalo State Park, which is one of the things he gets to do every year. But this this here is ice rescue training. This is one of our cadet classes uh, going through self-rescue training. Um, you know, water can be unforgiving. So our officers need to be prepared um, for anything that happens out there. So we give them a lot of training. They get a lot of water rescue training, uh, both self-rescue and then being able to rescue others. Um, right here, they're doing throw bags on the ice. One of the the important things to do is, you know, if somebody fell through the ice, I may not want to rush right out there and try to help or else I might be in in right beside them. Um, so much like any type of water rescue, uh, reach, throw, go type of, of mentality. Uh, so that's what they're doing there with the ice rescue stuff. Um, right now, these these officers, this is actually another training scenario uh, I can tell from uh, the area. That's at Stackhouse, and they're doing uh, uh, streamside checks. Uh, as part of their evaluation before they graduate. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things we're doing, checking licenses, checking creels, um, checking sizes, uh, that kind of thing. We do, yeah, oper yeah. We, we do operate uh, various vehicles, you know, patrol vehicles, as well as boats. And uh, that, that's just the, some more uh, training footage. Let's see what we have coming up here. I do have a question from Facebook for you. All right, so it looks like we're back to the uh, patrolling the uh, the Three Rivers area there. Here is a question regarding something that you mentioned earlier about deputy waterways conservation officers. Um, Robbie on Facebook has a question. He wants to know what are the requirements to be. He says volunteer deputy, and is that is that accurate? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, volunteer deputy has. Uh, Similar prerequisites to be a full-time officer. Um, you know, we give a, a, a test locally. The, fir the first step is to um, apply through the region that you live in. Uh, we have six regions across the state. Uh, you would contact that region office, tell them that you're interested in being a deputy, and they would provide you with an application and set up a test. We actually do the test, score the test, and, and then uh, go from there. The requirements then from that is to have act 235 um which is uh, the officer or the the officer candidate would do on their own act 235 is what's called the lethal weapons training act and uh, it's a 40 i think a 44 hour course that's done at many uh, community colleges around the state but it is a prerequisite to be one of our deputies that you complete that of course upon successful completion of that and then also successful completion of our training facility uh, we will reimburse for that training, that upfront training. Um, so, you know, beyond that, then we we split our training up for deputies into five long weekends and uh, take them to Stackhouse and run them through the deputy training program, where they learn a lot of the same skills that a full-time officer um, has, um, but also some things they don't cover because they don't have the authority to, like um, general crimes uh, under the crimes code, vehicle code, stuff like that. Uh, deputies are limited only to Fish and Boat Commission enforcement or Title 30 enforcement. So it is a difference in, in training and responsibility. Uh, but in a nutshell, that's how you do it. The first step, like I said, is call the region office, reach out to them and say, hey, I live within the region. I'm interested in being a deputy. Can you send me an application? And then, uh, and then we go from there. Um, I will tell you that deputies, I started as a deputy. We have a lot of officers that started with a deputy, either for, for the Fish and Boat Commission or even, even the Game Commission. Um, when I did it, I looked at it as a expensive hobby um, because it is a volunteer. There is a stipend that we pay uh, for for various work when the budget allows for it, and uh, but it, they do not get a, a, a paycheck, so to speak. All right, we're going to round things out as we're, you know, approaching the, you know, 35, 40 minute mark here in our conversation with the Waterways Conservation Officer this morning. But uh, let's talk about something that came up recently. We announced uh, earlier, it was in, in uh, mid-January, uh, the Fish and Boat Commission announced the consolidated statewide schedule for the 2021 trout season. 
which means a single statewide mentored youth day on March 27th and a single statewide opening day on April 3rd. Um, I'm not sure if uh, it looks like we lost Rachel for a few moments as she tries to connect. I'll just throw this one to you, Colonel Britcher. But you just want to go over not only the importance of those dates and what that means for the state, but also anything else that you want people to know as we prepare for the upcoming trout season. Uh, sure. A couple things. The dates are well publicized. Uh, we're going to start stocking early uh, next week the, the, on Monday and uh, start putting those fish out uh, a couple weeks earlier. Uh, one thing we did do to try to provide uh, more fishing opportunity is uh, all the impoundments across the state that are uh, trout stocked waters have been uh, designated as open to year round fishing. So from the 15th through the opening day, um, except for the mentored youth day, because you can harvest on mentored youth day, but from the, the 15th through the opening day, there'll be catch and release um, fishing opportunities in those impoundments. Um, as far as the mentored youth day, that that comes in there's only one that's an opportunity to take uh, a youngster out with their uh, voluntary permit or uh, voluntary license they can they can go out and uh, catch and keep two fish the uh, uh, men mentee or mentor i should say also has the opportunity to go out and, and fish with them uh, one of the things with that is we look for you know uh you know that that individual type of, of fishing uh, relationship you know it's it's one thing like i have four kids it's one thing for me to take my four kids out and, and mentor them or me and my wife would do that um but what we what we don't like to see is is you know four individuals going out with with, with one child so that's not that's not permitted so that's one of the things that, that we deal with um year to year and then of course you got the opening day coming up in april uh, it is a statewide opener um you know, that was done because of the COVID considerations, trying to, to spread people out a little bit so we don't have the traveling, uh, you know, from one end of the state to the other for the, the dual openers or the, the separate openers. Um, so that's one of those things. Hopefully uh, we can get back to normal moving forward, but this is another year where we have to deal with with the, the, this pandemic and, and how we operate. Um, I know it's changed. Change is sometimes difficult. Um, this past year, we were hopeful that with the new year, that this would all just go away. Unfortunately, it hasn't, so we have to deal with it a little bit longer. Um, one thing we learned last year um, is that, you know, our anglers want to be out there. They want to do the right thing. And uh, and, and I tell this to, to cadets at the training school, you know, 99% of everybody we deal with are just good, solid people that make a mistake. But, you know, there is that segment that are actively out trying to violate. But, you know, we found out with COVID last year that people just want to be out and fishing. They want to be out enjoying the outdoors and, and get out of the house, so to speak. So we want to provide that opportunity again this year and keep people safe while we're doing it. Um, one thing I will mention as we're starting the stocking is the the, the officers at the district level um, have been coordinating volunteers to help with each stocking and I would recommend or, or ask that those that you know because we are posting the dates those that are that are planning on just showing up and helping um, we're not going to permit that this year you know we want everybody including our staff or especially our our officers and other staff that are there um, to be safe and everything so we have to sort of keep tabs on what's going on uh, more so than ever before because of you know social distancing contact tracing all that that goes into this whole um, COVID response. Um, so if, if you're just planning on showing up and I'm going to walk up and carry buckets, we're going to we're going to ask that you don't do that. And, and we prefer that you just watch from a distance this year and uh, let us do what we have to do to get the fish in. And uh, hopefully till next year, things will be back to normal. Um, so, you know, th that's one thing. One big ask I have for, for the viewing public today is that, you know, be uh, be supportive of what the officers and other staff are doing and uh, um, you know, allow them to do what they're doing from a distance, watch, and, uh, and like I said, next year, hopefully we'll be back to normal. You mentioned uh, <clears throat> the change is sometimes sort of tough. This one isn't a, a tough change. It's a positive change, but uh, we recently launched, along with the, the Game Commission, we, we launched a new uh, online licensing system called Huntfish PA. And as a result, what you know, people are accustomed to seeing yellow fishing licenses, that they get printed out when they go to get them. And now, now there'll be green fishing licenses. So here's the new one. This is this is the old one. I've seen that question come over before. We didn't get it specifically this morning, but 
people were concerned, oh, I, I bought my license in December and it was yellow. And now I got my license. Someone else got their license and it's green. Does that mean I'm going to be checked more? Or is my yellow license still good? So one of the, I'll just give you that question. It's a pretty easy one to answer. Uh, yeah, you know, most people are checked and, and they don't even know they're checked. You know, the, uh, I often in the field, and I'm sure Rachel, uh, if she could hear me, she probably uh, could say the same thing. You know, you walk up to people and check their license. They say, man, I've been fishing for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And I've never been checked. Well, in reality, you probably have been. Um, now you might get it with more frequency because of uh, doing away with the display requirement. Um, but the important thing is that you buy a license, you have it upon your person. It doesn't matter if it's a yellow one that says 2021 on it or, or a multi-year license or the new green one. You know, we're, we're looking for, you know, the, the, the good 2021 license and, you know, the color that's just, you know, it, it just right. is what it is with the change. Specifically, if, if you get it printed out at a store, it's it's going to be from now on. It's going to be it's going to be this this green color. Absolutely. But if you chose to print it out at home, which has been an option for years, you could print it out on, on white, on pink, on purple. It really doesn't matter. You, it's it's just the val validity of the license. And when you say most people, uh, you know, have probably been checked, that means someone's maybe watching from from a distance. Uh, you know, there, this is not necessarily the only way that you're being checked isn't always someone coming up to you and asking you personally to see your license. You Absolutely. guys are out there actively scanning shorelines, things like that. Yes, absolutely. Um, you, you know, you might have been looked at, you know, from a boat with an officer with binoculars or, or you know, just walking down a stream, you know, first day of trout season, officers will walk up a stream and check 100 people and you know stop and talk to the ones that you know that they have questions that are you know maybe have an extra fish on their creel on their on their their stringer because of you know they're sharing it with somebody which which uh, you know would, would prompt a, a check um but uh, a lot of times especially during the display you know if there's a license display there's a trout stamp you know we can check just cursory walking by and and say okay you know 90 ounces out of 10 you know, this, this person's doing the right thing. So a lot of people get checked and they don't even know they get checked. And, uh, you know, I will tell you though, that, that you know, um, the display of a license, because that has gone away, you know, we are checking people more closely um, because we do have to see if they have a license, you know, where, you know it's, it's in their wallet or wherever. Um, you know, of course, a lot of people still display guys like me that have been fishing my whole life and, and don't know any better than to, to put it on my hat that's where it still stays, you know, so um, there are still a lot of people that, that have chosen to display their license. And uh, then, of course, there's there's those that, that have it in their wallet or wherever. The important thing is, like I said, is that people buy a license and they have it with them whenever they encounter an officer. That way we can check and continue on our way and they can continue having a great day on the water. We'll wrap this up with Colonel Corey Britcher here as we just get to our last question or two from our uh, viewers on Facebook. But Maybe this is uh, someone who joined us a little late, but they had a little confusion over this, uh, the the uh, catch and release regulation or, you know, change that, that you talked about a few minutes ago. Um, as far as <clears throat> prior to the opening day, what waters, so ex, ex, let's give a scenario as to which waters apply and which waters do not apply to that, that regulation. Okay. It, it is only the impoundments. So, you know, if you look in your summary book, the area that you fish, if you fish an impoundment that traditionally is stocked and it's stocked again this year um, and normally would close March 1st until opening day, that impoundment has been added or designated as a year round fishing opportunity, um, along with those other impoundments that are traditionally open year round for, for fishing opportunity. But for trout, it's catch and release only. Um, so, you know, for example, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, locally, maybe, and maybe Rachel, you can jump in on Letterkenny or Letterkenny Reservoir as a local impoundment to me. That would be open um, year round fishing during this time from February 15th to opening day. It's catch and release only. And, uh, you know, so other impoundments like that, uh, uh, whether in a state park or one of ours or, you know, some other ownership, um, if we stock it during this trout preseason here, uh, and it's an impoundment, not a flowing water, but an impoundment, um, it'll be open to catch and release. 
All right. Cool. Another two two more quick questions, and then we'll uh, we'll end this session. I do notice that Rachel's having some connectivity problems, so we'll try to we'll try to mix her here. in here if, if we can get. Okay, I'm great. here. If so can... Rachel, here's a. X. Yep, yep, we can see you. So it's good to have you <laughs> back. Here's a question for you, and uh, this is simply: Does a parent need a license to take their child fishing? And when I say child, we'll define that as someone who is under the age of 16. So to take them fishing, um, if we're going to talk in the aspects of just the child fishing, no. If you're going to be assisting that child 15, age 15 and under, not 16, um, then you do not need a license. You can help them bait it. You can help them cast it. They need to actually physically hook the fish and reel it in themselves. Um, that just gives you guys an opportunity to to let a parent be able to go out there and let their child um, kind of experience the outdoors. And, and I'll tell you, <laughs> for young kids, most of the time you don't even have the opportunity to fish yourself. So when you're taking your young child out, you're just constantly untying lines and put baiting hooks and things like that. But as they do get older, it definitely gives you the opportunity to think that maybe this is an activity that you and your family would enjoy. So I then encourage you as they become more proficient in, in fishing, um, that it becomes a family activity where everyone kind of gets their license once they turn 16. So no, they do not need a license if you are assisting um, a child under 16 years old. But it is a good idea. I Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, if I could jump in or just add a little more to that, um, one of the one of the things we see is oftentimes, especially with younger kids, you know, the kids go out and they're fishing for a while, and then they grow tired. You know, they're throwing rocks, they're down the down the stream playing a little bit, and the parent, you know, then takes a chance. Well, we're here. I got the stuff. I'm going to fish anyhow. That's where people get themselves jammed up, and we don't like to see them get jammed up like that. We appreciate that they're taking the kids out and everything, but whenever the 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 uh, their child um, grows weary of it. Um, it's not now time for them to fish, and that and that's probably and Rachel's shaking her head. We see that a lot, and, and you know have to deal with that. And it's just one of those things, um, you know. But yeah, if you're helping them, have at it. Um, but uh, you know, if you're going to do it yourself, um, you know, then you need to have that license. And that's uh, when it comes to the mentored youth day. The mentored youth requirements are are slightly different too. That yes. can you go over those, please. You want to go ahead, Rachel? Um, for the mentored youth, they they do need to have a licensed adult with them um, to be a mentor. So, irregardless of being a parent, a mentor needs to be a licensed the trout stamp to take and that um, mentor that day. So that is the only um, variance to the to that uh, exception, so. Right, as a parent of two young kids, I, I can say that it's probably a good idea if you're gonna be fishing with the kids. Um, like you said, they can lose interest pretty quick. Next thing you know, there's a, uh, they're down the, down the stream and the, the rod is in the water and there's a, a, something biting. And now I'm over there and if I don't have a license, now I'm pulling in a fish, I'm in the act of fishing with a kid nowhere to be found. And it seems innocent enough, but um, by the book, that would be that would be taking a chance. So, yeah, we certainly suggest that uh, if you're going to be out there actively mentoring and fishing with the kids a lot, sure, it's a good idea to have your license just to cover every scenario. Last question: um, Kayaking has become such a uh, you know, and it, it's exploded as an activity with the number of participants, especially over the past year with individuals and families looking to you know find some good quality time outdoors uh, especially during this this quarantine period so uh, between the both of you take a stab at this one for people who are new to kayaking who may have picked up a kayak for three or four hundred dollars at the local uh, sporting goods store and head out to the lake or stream with virtually no experience uh, what are some things that people should do before they 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 take that on. Well, the first thing I would recommend is get some education. We have some great resources on our website for paddling safety. Um, we have uh, also there's links on there to various outside organizations that offer a, a free um, paddling course. Um, you know, I would recommend they, they get some some education. You know, with, with the growth of kayaking, 
Um, you can go just about anywhere and, and buy a, a beginner kayak, uh, pretty, pretty inexpensive, and you can be on the water in a short amount of time. Um, you know, we have some, uh, like I said, our website has stuff. We have our YouTube channel has some videos on um, that are that are really good. Um, they're short. Um, they get to the point and give you some quick education to, to help keep you out of, uh, of harm's way. Um, right now, the unpowered boats across the country, not just here in Pennsylvania, but specifically kayaks uh, are just, you know, it's exploding. And that's great. Um, however, with that, so are the fatalities. Um, this time of year, we do have a mandatory wear of life jackets in Pennsylvania from um, November 1st through uh, the end of April. You have to wear your life jacket if you're on a, a, a kayak, and uh, that has helped cut down some of the fatalities. Um, but there's just things you need to know where you're where you're boating, what what to look out for. It, it's just one of those things that you know we think that oh, I'm going to grab the kayak and go for a quick trip. What could go wrong? Well, again, we're dealing with water. A lot could go wrong. So we just ask people to take the time to learn a little bit about what they're doing and to be safe. Every every kayaker, even outside of, of the mandatory wear period, does have to have a life jacket on board, size appropriate and serviceable. And, uh, you know, uh, I recommend to wear it. Rachel, you got anything you want to add? Sure. sure. Um, I, uh, a big and of of going out um, with is definitely your water. And I see this a lot, um, having a diverse area to patrol. Um, we get some people who think that they're going to go down to the Susquehanna River, Lake Clark, and get out there and it's going to be calm water because it's a, the reservoir impoundment on the Susquehanna River and it's going to be a nice, enjoyable kayaking trip for the family. But they get down there and um, you've got boats, uh, 100 plus horsepower boats that are just, you know, making the water pretty much unbearable to be able to kayak. So, um, or going to a state park that maybe has a higher horsepower limit where you're having larger boats. So knowing your waterway um, is definitely a big component of knowing um, when you're going to go kayaking. Um, and I know on our website, we have a lot of those interactive maps that can tell you whether or not the, the lake is maybe an electric only lake or um, it's no, uh, it's only paddled um, craft or like our um, our water trails where it will show you different places that you can put in and put out, like say on the, the yellow breaches of the common planet. Um, so I think that's another big aspect, just knowing your waterway. Okay, all right, and, and this is the last question we'll take. It's, it's 11 o'clock, you guys have been with us for about an hour and I really appreciate your time. Um, Brian on Facebook, asks this question. He says, I have a stream that is stocked by a trout club, but not the state. Can I fish that stream before opening day? Well, trout season closes, you know, the, the uh, February 15. Right now it's the extended season. But when trout season closes, if it's not stocked, you can fish it, of course, but it's not, uh, you cannot harvest trout outside of the season. All right. Colonel Corey Britcher, uh, Waterways Conservation Officer, Rachel Turner-Diaz, I want to thank you both for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun uh, as part of our 2021 Virtual Outdoor Expo, this conversation with a conservation officer. Did I say that right? Because sometimes I say con conversation officer. <laughs> We're good at that, too. Definitely. Yeah, you guys are good at that. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. As always, uh, our session here uh, it was streamed on Facebook Live today. I want to thank uh, our producer behind the scenes, Andy Desco. I want to thank Dee Fisher, uh, another one of our regional education specialists, for filtering in the questions for us to answer today. If you have, uh, or if you're looking for more information about waterways conservation officers and anything to deal with the Fish and Boat Commission, including the upcoming spring 2021 trout season, please visit our website, fishandboat.com. We're going to be back this afternoon streaming again live at one o'clock for our next session, which is all about Pennsylvania's steelhead program. So I hope you'll join us. Until then, thank you to our guests and have a great day. Be safe, everybody. Thank you.